Well, I knew, uh, I knew this would go fast. It always does. Uh, so we come to the fourth and final presentation in this series, uh, Lord and Giver of Life on the Person and Power of the Holy Spirit. Let me begin by reading to you 2 Timothy. I thank God whom I serve with a clear conscience, as did my fathers, when I remember you constantly in my prayers. As I remember your tears, I long night and day to see you, that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you. Hence, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is within you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity or cowardice, but rather a spirit of power and love and self-control. So St. Paul said to Timothy, and so God says to you, the moment of your baptism, you received the Holy Spirit. Rekindle in yourself this gift of the fire of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I told you before that the remedy for all the world's problems and troubles is the Holy Spirit. He's the gift who contains all gifts. Without the Holy Spirit, we can do nothing. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Without me, you can do nothing. And that is surely true. It's the Holy Spirit who forms us into Jesus Christ. He's like a divine artist, a sculptor, for instance. You know, sculptor can work in clay, right? Clay soft, right? Malleable. Uh, sculptor can work with marble. That's uh, kind of hard, cold. Nonetheless, the artist can bring something beautiful out of that cold, hard marble. The Holy Spirit can take the clay of humanity if we're malleable, docile, open, and he can form us into the image in which we're created. Now, we know we're created in the image of God. Well, what's the image of God? Well, the Lord Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. So if you want to know what it means to truly be in the image of God, you have to look at the Lord Jesus Christ. To become more like him, that's a work of the Holy Spirit. And since today is, of course, the solemnity of the Assumption, we celebrated Mass on that, for that solemnity, uh, I'll remind you that in the beginning, the Incarnation, remember that it was the Blessed Mother and the Holy Spirit that resulted in the Incarnation. Remember Mary, docile, the humble handmaid of the Lord, and the Holy Spirit overshadowed her. She was docile, malleable, open, humble, obedient. That disposed her fully of course, being immaculately conceived, she had no original sin, no personal sin, nor could she sin. Now, that's a theologically correct statement. Uh, sometimes people will disagree with the last one because they don't fully understand the theology. But it's a true statement. No original sin, no personal sin, nor could she sin. 
Now, the pseudo-theologian may say, well, then she wasn't free. No, not true. I could ask you a question. Do the blessed in heaven have free will? Yes. Can the blessed in heaven sin? No. That's a contradiction, you might say. No, it's not. That's a paradox. And, and that's the subject of several university-level courses that one could take at a good Catholic university. Those in heaven, the blessed in heaven, are confirmed in grace. Can they sin? No. no. Or do they have free will? They have absolutely free will. Their free will has been totally liberated, and they're totally absorbed in God. Blessed Mother had no original sin, no personal sin, nor could she sin. Through the fiat of the Blessed Virgin and the power of the Holy Spirit, remember when the angel announced to her the plan of God, the Blessed Mother said, fiat, be it done unto me according to thy word, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Blessed Mother, Holy Spirit, Jesus. That's how Jesus came to us. That's how we can go to Jesus, through Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit, to our Heavenly Father. That's a divine economia, the Greek word, the economy of salvation. I, I'll give you a hint, a tip. Now, not that I know everything, but as the result of my life, uh, my studies, my ministry, almost 20 years of priesthood, five university degrees, teaching, preaching, all that time, uh, I'll, I'll tell you what, a, what, what the saints knew. It's not a secret, but sometimes you'd think it was today. Go to your mother. She'll bring you to her divine spouse, the Holy Spirit. And Jesus will be formed more perfectly within you. You'll be empowered to live the life of Christ. Mary and the Holy Spirit equals Jesus. Another principle. All the difficulties we struggle with today, suffer from today, um, you know, the political difficulties, and even the politics in the church, which, which for those of us who've endured it, lived through it, uh, had, uh, you know, an intimate view of it at times, uh, it can be uh, more disturbing and uglier than the politics in the secular order, I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> there's an old saying, no one does evil like those who do it in the name of God. Uh, it, it can be a distressing thing. The remedy, the Holy Spirit. Stay close to the Blessed Mother, be open to the Holy Spirit, and you'll grow more and more into the presence of, of Jesus Christ. Uh, you look at the po political situation and you kind of marvel at it. Uh, you look at some of the things, you know, I, and I don't mean to criticize, um, but I can't help it. <laughs> You know, Congress, sometimes, and I don't mean, uh, you know, this administration, that all of them. Some are better than others, admittedly, but, but they all have their problems, you know. John, John, John F. Kennedy, President Kennedy, <laughs> once said to an assembled group of scholars at the White House, I think this is the most extraordinary collection of talent and, and I could say this to Congress. I think this is the most extraordinary collection of talent, of human knowledge, that has ever been gathered at the White House, with the possible exception of when Thomas Jefferson dined alone. <laughs> you know, you wonder, my goodness, what, what are these guys doing? And ladies, you know, that, that, that's no Holy Spirit, 
No gifts of the Holy Spirit, no wisdom, no understanding, knowledge, counsel, piety, fear of the Lord, none of that. There is a singular absence of wisdom frequently in leadership. And, and you know, part of this has been uh, facilitated by a contemporary curse. And we've got it inside the church in places, as well as in the secular order, and it's called political correctness. That's a curse. Political correctness. Don't be weak in the knees and soft in the spine. It's too late in the game. You know, you and I are too old. We, we've been through too much. Well, we're, we're going to sell Christ for 30 pieces of silver at this point? Nah, don't do that. Be strong. You know, ha have your convictions. Look, I admit that, that I'm, uh, I'm a little bit on the, uh, on the odd side. As a matter of fact, frequently, almost daily, I kind of wonder how on earth did I end up a, a priest? Now, you know, I mean, really, you, do, you don't know me. You think you do, but you don't really. You know, I wonder how on earth I have a strange skill set. Now, some of it is, you know, the normal uh, gift of a preacher. Or, well, you know, I acknowledge the gift of God. I'm thankful for it. And, and, but, you know, some of my, the other stuff, my, some of my experiences in life, uh, <laughs> I, I admit, you know, I'm, I'm a little, I'm, I'm quite a bit different. Uh, one time, uh, I was preaching someplace, and during the question and answer session, a woman said, uh, well, I understand that you shoot guns, and you're a supporter of the Second Amendment. She said, I'm in favor, which, <laughs> which is a true statement, by the way, and she said, well, I'm in favor of gun control, and I said, me too. She said, you are? And I said, oh, yes. Number one, stance. Number two, grip. Number three, sight alignment. Number four, sight picture, breathing, trigger pull, follow through and recovery. That's called gun control. Another time, somehow, someone had gotten a picture of me in Alaska. I was on a, a hunting trip. I, I was on a grizzly bear hunting trip. And somehow, it got on the internet a picture of me with a big grizzly bear I'd shot in the snow. Now, I didn't mean for that to be released, but yeah, I did it. <laughs> The bear resides in my den now. It's a nice blonde one. It was a big one. So this picture of me and this big bear in the snow in Alaska. And I'm at another event, and an agitated person raises their hand and said, I understand you, Hunt. And I said, that's right, I've been doing it since I was about eight years old. Well, I'm a member of PETA. And I said, well, so am I. She said, you are? I said, yeah. People eating tasty animals. <laughs> now, I shouldn't do that, I guess, but I can't help it sometimes. I grew up in upstate New York. That's part of, that was part of our American tradition. You know, we, 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 we let me tell you something. You know, and, and that's just, I, I, it may not directly have anything to do with religion, but it has something to do with common sense. There is a lot of fuzzy thinking today. We have to do our part. And, and by the way, I respect everybody's position and opinion. You know, I love animals. You know, people think, well, that, that, how can that be? That's a contradiction. Nope. 
Yeah, you know, I, I, nobody loves their dogs more than I love mine. You know, so I, I, and I love nature, and I have great respect for God's creation. And I know that seems like a contradiction, but uh, there are people, outdoors people in, in this audience right now, and they know exactly what I'm talking about. You know, no one has given more money or done more for nature, you know, for ducks, you know, Ducks Unlimited. Uh, why? Because we're out there. We understand it. We, we feel it. It's part of us. It's part of our heritage. I'm, I'm not here to promote, you know, uh, the outdoor sports, although they, they've helped me a lot throughout the course of my life. But I've noted an interesting thing. Maybe you have too. There seems to be a correlation between, you know, people that seem to be right thinking in certain things seem to be right thinking in a lot of other things. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed that, uh, that, that the so-called pro-choice element and the pro-gay marriage element are fast allies? Have you noticed that the anti-Second Amendment people and the anti-hunting people, they all seem to gravitate to the same place? And conversely, the pro-life people, you know, the outdoors people, the pro-Second Amendment people, interestingly, not always, but frequently, they're on the same side of all those questions. It is not a coincidence. Don't be a fuzzy thinker. Personal opinions, I respect, and it's okay. You know, and if somebody doesn't like the fact that, that, that um, you know, <laughs> I've been a hunter and, a, and a, an outdoor person and a gun person since I was eight years old, that's okay. You know, they have a right not, not to like that. But we have a right to live the heritage we've been given. We've got a crisis. We've got a crisis in thinking. We've got a crisis that is largely driven by indifference and cowardice. Look at our country. Look at what's happened. Look at the complacency. You know, we're sitting back and the country is unraveling in front of our very eyes and the majority of people. Now, thank God, an increasing number of people are getting concerned. Nonetheless, a huge number of people are just totally disinterested. You're going to blink your eyes and wake up a slave. And it won't be the first time in history either. The spirit we've been given is no timid spirit. The United States of America, Canada, the great countries of Europe, Christianity enabled them to flourish. You know, uh, uh, liberty, the rights of women, you know, that people like to talk, or they like to badmouth the Catholic Church. Oh, the male-dominated patriarchal church. Let me tell you, before the Christianity came along, women were chattel, property, like cattle, in many cultures. We don't accept that in Christianity. Absolutely equal in dignity. Male and female, he created them absolutely equal in dignity. He created them, but not the same did he create them. Adam and Eve, male and female, he created them. Adam and Steve, no. And I'll tell you, that is politically incorrect. And there are two things that will get you killed at worst, in trouble at best. 
And that's a strong, charitable, you, you, we have to be loving, but rooted in the truth. Life issues, clarity in thinking, on abortion, the so-called, you know, gay marriage. You have to think clearly. Now, the Catholic Church contributed to the greatness of nations. And do you know why? It, look around now. Look, you look at you. You know what's going on. You're astute people. You, you at least look at the news. Have you seen what's happened to Europe, to Western Europe, to society? Have you seen what socialism has done to most Western European countries? They're dying or dead. They're unraveling. They become, they're going from bad to worse, and we want to follow that. That's immoral. I'm not making a political statement here. I'm making a moral statement here. It is immoral. You let it happen, it's your fault. Every one of us has to be strong in the Lord. The spirit we've been given is no timid spirit. Now, that, 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 that quote from St. Paul's second letter to Timothy, this, you know, the spirit we've been given is no, you know, you, you, depending on the version, the translation of scripture that you use, one is no cowardly spirit, another one no timid spirit, no spirit of timidity. That, to me, is so accurate, it, dis it, it depicts what has happened to us so accurately. The timidity of so many of us in the Catholic Church, frequently the leadership, we don't want to fight. We don't want to rock the boat. We don't want to upset anybody, you know. When I used to travel a lot and, and did up, up to 40 or more missions a year, I remember one on the West Coast, a large group of people uh, invited me to a certain place and we accepted and the, and the arrangements were being made and progressed and they had a thousand people registered, 2,000, 3,000, and then towards the end, the bishop of that diocese said, no, 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 he can't come here. We don't want him here because he's a divisive influence. So they went to the next diocese over. Another thousand people, another two thousand people. And almost to the up, a couple weeks before the event, I think the first bishop talked to the second one and said, no, 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 we don't want him here. He's a divisive influence. They went to a third place. Another thousand, two thousand, you know, the crowd was growing and growing and growing. So finally that one happened. We got in. You know what the theme of my first talk to open that conference was? It was on the passage where Jesus said, so you think I've come to bring peace. I tell you, I have not come for peace, but division that will separate a household of five, three against two, and two against three, father against son, and son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother. And you ask yourself, what could that mean? How can the Prince of Peace, and Jesus surely is the Prince of Peace, how could he say, I've come not for peace, but division? Another translation, I've come to bring a sword. And well, what's the division? What's the sword? Truth. The two-edged sword of the word of God. And I can attest to you with absolute certainty that if you present the truth in a clear, uncompromised fashion, what will happen? Dissension. It'll separate, divide, 
Those who are receptive to the truth receive it, and those who are not receptive to the truth reject it. That's the division Jesus was talking about. General Colin Powell has given a lot of lectures on leadership. And one of his statements, one of his principles, is that you can't be a leader unless you're not afraid, I won't use his exact military type terminology, but you can't be a leader if you're afraid to make some people angry. You can't be a leader if you're afraid people will get mad at you. If you are always tiptoeing around, mealy mouth, soft in the spine and weak in the knees, you can't lead. You are unfit for leadership. Now that's a hard, cold saying, but I don't care who you are. Mom, dad, priest, religious, president, congressperson, senator, judge, if you aren't strong enough to stand on principle, then you're not fit to lead. I told you before, I quoted what Jesus said. He said, I, I would that you were hot or cold, uh, but you're neither hot nor cold, you're lukewarm. Therefore, I'll spit you out of my mouth. The Lord does not like lukewarmness, mediocrity. We are called to excellence, and you, and you can't be happy unless you strive for excellence. And I, I want to call to your consciousness a state of affairs that exists in this country and most of Europe. It has been facilitated, it, ha it has been enabled by a, a gross kind of liberalism that takes away incentive from the individual human person. The individual should want to strive for excellence. The individual shouldn't be handed everything, shouldn't be reduced to a state where they don't have to strive for excellence. Takes away incentive and destroys society. That isn't the Holy Spirit that animates a situation like that. Remember what Pope Leo XIII said about pure socialism. Now, some socialism, some social programs are necessary. Some form of social security, a basic social aid. But when you cross the line and begin enabling people in a kind of, I don't know, decadence, I guess I could call it, where they feel they don't have to work very hard because they're going to get everything from the government anyway. You know what the government becomes like? I call them the big drug dealer in the sky. You know, the drug dealer gets a new customer and he'll give them a little, a little free taste of his wares to get them hooked. You know, a little heroin, a little cocaine, a little meth. The government will give you a little money and get you hooked. And pretty soon, your automobiles and your health care and everything else is provided by the government and you begin to lose incentive to work hard. That debilitates you as a human being. And that isn't the Holy Spirit. That's not a bold spirit. That's a cowardly, timid spirit. One of the worst things you can do to a human being is facilitating them not working, making it easy for them to not 
work. A man's dignity is stripped from him unless he works, unless he feels that he, he can support his family, strive for excellence. I mean, that, that our country, you know, the immigrants, my, my ancestors, Italian people, Irish people, Polish people, you know, a lot of the ethnic groups that live around Buffalo and in all the rest of this country too. They came here and, and they wanted to succeed. How they longed that their children and their grandchildren would have something better. And they worked for it. You know, my, my great grandparents, my grandparents, they, they worked in a brickyard. They shoveled coal. My grandfather shoveled coal into a boiler for Niagara Mohawk for years when he started. Long hours, brutally hard work. And they, the, the, what the love of their life, the hope of their life is that their children and grandchildren could have something better. And even when they were poor, they had dignity. They had something precious. And that's from the Holy Spirit. We've lost a lot of that. When life gets too easy, decadence sets in. When life is hard, you strive to overcome difficulty. You sacrifice. Remember, I said it before, and I mean it, and I know it's a harsh saying, and th this is why a lot of people don't like me, because they think I'm mean. I'm not mean. I love people. I want the best for people. I'm definitely not mean. I'm definitely not prejudiced. You know, I, I grew up, my street, where I grew up was mostly Polish and Italian people. And the next street over was, in those days, was one street where all the African-American people lived. And, and a good half or more of my friends were African-American kids. We went to school together. We, we were in classes together. We played sports together. I grew up without prejudice. Now, I know it existed in my day, but it was mostly in my parents' generation. And there was some in mine, but, but I didn't. My best friend in the Army was a black man from Alabama. My best friend when I was at the University of Navarre in Spain was an African priest from Kenya who's been in New York now for some time, in southern New York. My best friend. I can say before you and God, I don't have a prejudiced bone in my body. But sometimes I can be misconstrued. You know, they say, oh, you're prejudiced because uh, you, you don't, uh, you don't, uh, you're not in favor of welfare and so forth and so on. I'm in favor of helping people. Don't get me wrong. I am. I believe in helping people. I believe in helping disadvantaged people, people who are injured, uh, have disabilities. I believe in helping people. But I don't believe in stripping people of their human dignity by making it easy for them to not work. That is the kiss of death to a human being. That is not the Holy Spirit. Recall once again the words of Pope Leo XIII. Pure socialism is not the answer to all of society's ills, even if we've gone too far on the side of capitalism. Be careful the pendulum doesn't swing too far because, uh, because socialism won't help the poor. Socialism will reduce everybody to the same lowest common denominator of poverty and misery. Takes away incentive, willingness to strive for excellence. That's not the Holy Spirit. That's the antithesis of the Holy Spirit. That's a weak, timid, cowardly spirit and it results in human slavery and I wouldn't impose that or wish that on any of my brothers or sisters. Think straight, be soft-hearted, but don't be soft-headed.
be careful. Watch out for fuzzy thinking. And, and don't allow a sick, decadent, fuzzy thinking society to impose its disvalues on you. The spirit we've been given is no timid spirit. Look at the timidity in the last decades in the church. You look at some of the things we've seen and you marvel at it. How could they put up with it? You know, uh, large numbers of theologians, priests, even some bishops, against the church's teaching on life, came out and signed statements rejecting formally and in writing Humane Vitae. I'm going to tell you something. That's where all the trouble began. Pope Paul VI prophetically said that artificial contraception and the general acceptance of it will lead to the proliferation of abortion. It will just become another method of birth control. It was prophetic. It has happened. And all too often, we've been too timid, too cowardly to stand up straight for what we believe. The lack of leadership, artificial contraception, abortion, I, can you believe it? The law of this great land, it's a human, right, a human rights violation that screams out to heaven for a remedy. 50 million and counting, more or less, since Roe versus Wade. There's a passage in the Old Testament it says to, to the, something to the effect, can God bless or give favor to judges who do evil under the pretext of good? Can they be that dumb? They're blind, they're deaf, they're crippled, they're dead. They need a miracle. And that's where you come in. That's where you come in. Don't curse them. You know, don't, don't curse them. You know, not, not, not them, not the, not the administration, not the Congress. Pray for them. Because you know, if you curse them, we might end up with something a lot worse. And that's hard to believe, but we might. Bless them. Offer reparation for them. Pray for them. You know, euthanasia, that's a logical consequence of an artificial contraceptive abor uh, abortion mentality. If you can kill a baby in the womb, you can darn sure kill an old person or a sick person. And, uh, you know, as Pope John Paul II l lay dying on the other side of the Atlantic, Terry Sharvo lay dying on this side of the Atlantic. They killed her under the specious pretext of mercy. She, she wasn't sick. They starved her to death, one of the most cruel forms of death that exists. Pope John Paul II was just as helpless as she was. Should they have starved him to death? A human being is a human being. From the moment of conception to the last moment of natural life, the Holy Spirit is no cowardly spirit. The Holy Spirit is a spirit of power, a bold spirit. Wake up, Catholics. Do your part. Be strong in the Lord. You know, the days of sitting on a fence are over. Don't think you'll be able to sit on a fence much longer. You can't. 
because God's mighty hand is about to reach down, take hold of the fence and shake it. And you're going to come down on one side or the other. You're going to find that you're for him or against him. You're either going to conform yourself to the spirit of this world or you're going to be empowered by the spirit of the living God. One or the other, no middle ground. Right or wrong, truth or lies, good or evil, life or death. Therefore, choose life. Go the right way. A crisis of leadership. We've got a crisis of leadership. You know, I've spoken about this before. Uh, one, of my, one of my friends in the Special Forces over 20 years, Master Sergeant, also a Massachusetts State Trooper. He wrote a book recently, and, and I highly recommend it. It's not really readily available yet, but it will be, and, and, and I'll do what I can to distribute it. It's called The Leadership of Jesus, and it's based upon the principles of leadership that the military, especially the United States Army, has taught for many years. The church has many good things, teaches, hopefully, in most places, good theology. We have many wonderful bishops and priests, thank God for them. But the church has no systematic, formal leadership training. And it shows, unfortunately, in many cases. The Army uses an acronym to take the, the word leadership. My friend Mike Cutrone wrote this book, The Leadership of Jesus, and uh, I've plagiarized from it before it was ever in the form of a book. But he, he came out and, and, and I, I requested that he just do a little presentation for some of the people that work with me on leadership, and he did. And then this book eventually happened. The word leadership, L, first letter of the word, L. Lead by example. That means from the front. A leader has to go first. You know, there are people in this audience who were members of the Army Rangers. And the, the story from uh, World War II, Normandy, and on, on Omaha Beach, the second wave that came in, uh, there was a general, Norm Cota. He came in and they were pinned down. It, it was murderous fire from the cliffs over the beach. And they were, they were being just killed on the beach. And the general got in there and, and, he, and he said, uh, uh, which unit is this? And a, and, a, and, a, and a timid lieutenant said, I believe it was Fifth Rangers, sir. And the general exploded with power, and I can't repeat what he said, but the substance of it was, Rangers lead the way. And they went straight into the teeth of death. And they broke through the enemy forces, and victory ensued. Catholics, lead the way. We are in war. We, we're pinned down on the beaches. Murderous, murderous fire of sin, taking people out left and right, one after the other. And we're going to be timid and cower. The general said, look, we're dying on the beaches. Let's go inland and die. Amen, General. Don't die on the beach, Catholics. Charge straight into the enemy fire. That's the Holy Spirit. Don't back off. Don't quit. Don't be a coward. Don't be timid. The spirit we've been given is no cowardly spirit, no 
timid spirit. The great Saint John Vianney, patron saint of parish priests, and I'll say this during this year for priests, he once said that if a priest were in the pulpit and absolutely would be certain that he be murdered for preaching the truth, all the more necessary would it be for him to do so. You have to do it. You can't back off. You know, you, you may have been knocked down. It is not a disgrace to be wounded in battle. You know, we've all been wounded in some way or another in life. Sin is the wound I'm talking about. You know, everybody can sin. We're all sinners. You can be knocked down. You can be wounded. You know, you get wounded in battle to give you a purple heart. That's not a disgrace. The disgrace is to cut and run. That's the disgrace. Don't do it. Hang in there. Run the race to the finish line. And so you've got to lead by example. E, excellence, education, not mediocrity. You know, educate your children. And let me tell you something. If you are waiting for the church to educate your children in the faith, you are remiss in your parental duties. You better do it. The church can help you. The parish can help you and should. The CCD program can help you. The Catholic schools can help you. But that's secondary. The primary responsibility for the education of our young people is parents. And woe to you if you don't provide for the education of your children. So educate those in your care. Excellence, you know, strive for excellence. Give a good example to your children. Look, if, if you hate your job, if all you do is complain about your profession, maybe it's time to get out and do something else. Losers make excuses. Winners make it happen. So do that and show your children a good example. Otherwise, they're going to grow up lax, indifferent, and mediocre. And I'll tell you something, to do that to your children and grandchildren, that's a terrible thing. What a curse to bestow upon those who come after you. A, attitude. If you are filled with the Holy Spirit, no cowardly spirit, no timid spirit, a bold spirit, courageous spirit, you're going to have the attitude of a winner. And I have been around winners in athletics, in the military, in the corporate world, in the professions, and in the church. And the principles are always the same. Attitude is huge. If you have a defeatist attitude, a negative attitude, an ashamed attitude, if you're ashamed of your faith, afraid. Now, you don't have to be obnoxious about it. You don't have to beat people over the head with it. Be humble. Be kind. Patient. But be strong. You've got to have the right attitude. And the Holy Spirit's the one who gives it to you. You know, fire, remember, uh, that, that's one of the symbols for the Holy Spirit. You remember Pentecost, when, when the Holy Spirit came down on them as, as flames or tongues of fire? Fire has some interesting properties. Fire gives off light. That's the truth. Fire gives off warmth. That's love. Fire transmits itself. You get close to the fire, you get warm and warmer and warmer yet, and then you could catch on fire. And Jesus said, I've come to cast fire on the earth, and oh, how I long that it already be ignited. And so, you know, don't be afraid to be on fire with the power of the Holy Spirit. No, no spirit of timidity, no cowardly spirit. Don't be afraid of that. 
ask for it. Open yourself to it. We've got to do this. If we don't do this, I guarantee you it's going from bad to worse. So you have to have the attitude of a winner. D, the fourth letter in the word leadership. D, discipline. Discipline is essential for victory in anything. If you're a student, whether in grammar school or graduate school, you've got to have discipline to succeed. If you play a sport, you've got to have discipline to excel. If you're in a profession, medicine, law, plumber, you know, whatever it is, a trade, doesn't matter. You've got to have discipline. You must discipline yourself. Parents, if you don't instill discipline in your children, that's your fault. Shame on you. If they start to unravel, maybe it's because you didn't give them discipline. And if you hadn't before, I know it's harder to do it when they're older, but like my mother said to me, I don't care how big you are, when you're in this house, you're going to do it my way. When you're 18 and out of here, that's your business. When you're under my roof, that's my business. You know, they had a very, very uh, um, intense or great sensitivity to their responsibility. Parents did. Even grandparents, you know. Priests as well should. Discipline. Have it yourself, instill it in others. Empower. You've got to empower to be a leader. Empower your children. Empower those around you, your friends, your co-workers, those that you influence through your profession or your trade. Empower them. How do you do that? Well, the best example is example. Hmm? The most eloquent sermon is a life well lived. St. Francis one time was in the countryside of Italy and he said to uh, one, of the, one of the early brothers, he said, brother, let's go to town and preach. I think it was Brother Leo. So they went to the closest town in the city square and uh, they were dressed in their ragged habits. And they started to walk around in a circle around the city square. And they did this for a few minutes and then a uh, half hour. And, and finally, the brother said to St. Francis, but, but, but Francis, you said we were going to preach. And he said, we just did. Example. The people saw them, saw their total dedication to God, their evangelical poverty, their love for the church. And that was the most eloquent sermon they could have ever preached. If you, if you want your children to have good values, you'll have to give example. You know, when you get agitated or angry, don't curse a blue streak and use God's name in vain. If you don't want them to smoke, don't smoke. You know, if you don't want them to drink, don't. You don't want them to do a lot of things that could hurt them, give good example. Empower them. Receive and respect input. You have to do that as a leader, whether it's a leader of a family, a business, athletic team, military unit, Receive and respect input. Pastors, priests, receive and respect input. You know, we, we have now parish councils in parishes, and the priest, the pastor, should receive and respect input. But he should also be the boss. He shouldn't be weak in the knees or soft in the spine. Receive and respect input, but in the end, if you've got responsibility, pastoral responsibility, then exercise it. Be respectful, receive the input, 
But then you make the decision. And if you're afraid to make a decision, or you know, my mother had a saying, you know, uh, very frequently today, uh, <laughs> even in the church, you know, we, we want to get a consensus, you know, a democratic vote. Let me tell you something. Jesus Christ did not attend, intend that eternal truth be determined by a democratic vote. And my mother said, you know, if Moses had to get the people to arrive at a consensus, they'd still be wandering in the desert. <laughs> Receive and respect input, but make a decision, by golly, and be strong enough to carry it out. S, sacrifice. Well, we've talked about that, I think, a little bit. You can't be a leader without sacrifice. You know, I, and, and I told you in talking with the bishop, you know, he told me he's 73 years old. He, he, he has to sit down some. He's in pain from his, his back. He's got a, a difficult, and yet he has to go from one thing to the next, serving the people. That's sacrifice. That's the cross. And it's not easy. And it's not just us. I know you, you parents and spouses, you know what sacrifice is. Not easy, but it's necessary to be a leader. Humility, we've talked about humility. That's, that's part of that acronym, acronym of leadership. You've got to be humble. If you are not truly humble, uh, you won't be a good leader. So practice humility. Now, by the way, I'll tell you a little story about humility. One time a lady came to me and she said to me, Father, you know, I, I know that humility is very important and I really am serious about my spiritual life. And I would like, I, I'm not very humble though sometimes. And I would really, I, I desire to grow in humility. Would you pray for me that I could gain humility. I said, certainly. And I did. She, <laughs> I saw her a week later, and she said, you didn't pray for me. I said, what do you mean? And she, I, I said, uh, let me finish the story. I, I, things started to go badly in your life, right? You started to have all kinds of trials and tribulations. Yes, how did you know? Do you know how you grow in humility? Do you know what the exercise of humility is? Humiliation. <laughs> and God knows just how to give it to you. So if you want to grow in humility, you better believe you're going to get some trials, some humiliations. You know, they may be physical. You know, one time I was pretty strong and pretty agile and pretty athletic. And, 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 and now, although I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do better, you know, I sometimes feel like an old car with a lot of mileage and most of it over bad roads. <laughs> and, and a deacon <laughs> was, was talking to me before and he, he's had a lot of surgeries and he said, I, I've got more spare parts than an old wreck. In a way, that's a humiliation. You know, you, used to, you and I used to be a lot stronger than we are now. You know, a lot, a lot more agile, athletic, whatever. That, that can, that, those physical trials, they can be a humiliation. You know, I, I can't, I'm, I'm almost deaf. Well, like my grandmother used to say, I'm deaf in one ear and can't hear out the other. You know, I, I have horrible hearing. I don't see as well as I used to. You know, I have to wear glasses if I read fine print and it's not getting any better and I got news for you, it isn't going to. Emotionally, you know, there was a time when I wasn't afraid of anything. And I notice in recent years, I, I, I'm afraid to do a lot of things. I got, I've gotten somewhat timid. Hmm? That's not the Holy Spirit. Maybe it's just the natural aging process, but now I have to consciously overcome it. 
I refuse to give in to it. So I, I lay awake at night, and I'm telling you some nights I'm scared to death, almost afraid to get up in the morning, thinking about this, that, or the other thing. You, you wouldn't believe what I've been through in the, in the weeks leading up to this conference, and God only knows what I'm going to get in the weeks after it. And, and, and I lay awake at night thinking about it, and I, oh, no, now what? What's going to happen to me next? Fear in itself is some, it's an emotion. Everybody gets some of it. You know, we're fearful of, of this, that, or the other the thing. Fear of rejection, fear of an illness, fear of dying, fear of the loss of a loved one. I've talked to many soldiers who faced terrible danger, who were in terrible battles. They were scared. But like love, it's a decision. You do it. You just do it. And it's the Holy Spirit that will allow you, enable you, and empower you to do it. Humility. Initiative. Seize the initiative. Carpe diem. Seize the day. Don't wait for somebody else to teach your children the faith. Don't wait for somebody else to feed the poor or house the homeless or visit the sick or those are in prison. You do it. I remember once in the seminary, I went to the director of priestly formation, and I was worried about what if I get a, a, a bad bishop or a bad superior in the church? You know, what am I going to do? And he said, don't worry about them. He gave me a great piece of advice. You do it right. You make sure you're right with God. Don't worry about the other guys. You do it right. You be faithful. I remember another person that I talked to in a similar vein. She was a Carm discalced Carmelite nun, professed over 60 years. She had been the prioress of her monastery for decades. <clears throat> right before I, I, I was ordained, I, I said, but mother, what if I get a bad leader? What if I get a weak leader? Religious superior, bishop, whatever. Well, my son, you must pray for him. But, but mother, what if he doesn't convert? Well, then pray for a speedy demise. <laughs> An old Carmelite nun. <laughs> pray for his conversion. If he doesn't convert, well... I'm not sure about that one, but that's what she said. <laughs> the last letter in leadership, the acronym P, plan. Plan. Don't, don't just rattle through life without a plan. Pray. Prepare. Plan. Learn your faith. Live your faith. Hand your faith on to those that you love, your children your grandchildren. Listen, if the Catholic Church fails to be strong much longer, and you know, we've had great popes. I'm not talking about that leadership. We've had heroic and magnificent popes all through my lifetime. Uh, when I was born, uh, Pius XII was the pope. He was a great man, a heroic man, and everyone after the, him was also a great man, a wonderful pope, a holy pope. Great leadership from the top. And many, we've had many great bishops, and we still do, and many great priests. But there has been what I have, can call a crisis of middle management frequently. We get wonderful teaching from the top, but frequently it doesn't reach the people in the pews. Magnificent encyclicals, one after the next.
The majority of Catholics have never heard of it. They never got the teaching. Well, of course, that's not all the, the, the hierarchy's fault. If 80% of Catholics aren't even going to Mass on Sunday, I guess you, you know, you can expect that. But the, the other 20% of us that go to Mass regularly, we have to get stronger and stronger. You remember the story of Gideon's army in the Old Testament? Very small army defeated a great, a much greater force. We're like Gideon's army, the remnant. And that's, a, that's true. Well, you've heard that before, but it's true. There, there's a truth in that. There is no longer any room for mediocrity. You and I have to do our part, more than our part, because a lot of people aren't going to do their part, and we have to make up for them. But we have the Holy Spirit. He is no cowardly spirit. He is no timid spirit. Please be open to the power of the Holy Spirit. Be in a state of grace, first and foremost. Pray. Receive the sacraments in a state of grace. S study your faith. It's not inconsequential. You know, ignorance of the faith, ignorance of the scriptures, ignorance of our religion is ig ignorance of Jesus Christ. The first commandment is to love the Lord our God with our whole heart, mind, and soul. If you don't even want to know something about the one you love, do you really love them? Learn your faith. Study the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Read the Bible. Don't wait for somebody else to do it. The Holy Spirit will lead you. He's a good spiritual director, the best. He'll set you on fire. The greatest definition that I ever heard of a preacher, and a, and a great preacher said it. They asked him, Father, what is a great preacher? What does a great preacher do? Well, he said a great preacher goes in front of the people and sets himself on fire. And the people come to watch him burn. <laughs> and there's something to be said. I, I might alter it a little. You know, the Holy Spirit sets him on fire. And the people come to watch him burn. Same thing for you. And so it's about time to say goodbye. But we've been together for a little while, like the disciples in the upper room. It was good that we are here. Some of you I'll never see again. Except maybe in heaven, I hope. And so until then, I ask you... Please, please, remember the Holy Spirit. Have a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit. All you have to do is invite him. You have him through baptism, confirmation, but invite him into your life. Come, Holy Spirit. You know the prayer I like? Come, Holy Spirit, come by means of the powerful intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, your well-beloved spouse. My brothers and sisters, this spirit of courage, this bold spirit, the spirit of God, the spirit of truth will change your life, will empower you. You'll run the race to the finish line. You'll fight the good fight. He'll conform you into the image of Jesus. And then you and I very soon are going to stand before God. He'll smile at you, and I promise you, you'll hear these beautiful words. Well done. Well done. My good and faithful servant, enter now at last into the joy of your master's house. God bless you. God love you. And goodbye.